I am going to introduce our, our guest speaker, who's Sophia Wang, who is um, a good friend of mine, and I'm just really grateful that she came here. This is her first time to, is it your first time in the state of Utah? You drove through? Yeah, okay. First, first time at the Moran Eye Center, though, and it's just so great to have you here and, and have you uh, see our eye center and meet us and, and really appreciate it. Uh, Sophia is coming from uh, Stanford. She's a glaucoma clinician scientist there um, who is really on the cutting edge of, of artificial intelligence uh, research for eyes and especially for glaucoma. Uh, so I met Sophia when she was a resident. She was a resident at the Kellogg Eye Center at the University of Michigan and was really just, so I was there doing my research fellowship and so Sophia was just a huge star there and, and everyone loved her and uh, has really kind of lived up to that. She did her uh, glaucoma fellowship at Stanford and then stayed on faculty there. And she, her research, uh, her description is she's focused on big data informatics and AI and ophthalmology, and especially in working with electronic health records. And um, I've worked with her, collaborated with her on that too. And so uh, her interesting fact is that her hobby is fine arts or fiber arts. I misread it at first, fine arts, but it's fiber arts, which means uh, quilting, sewing, knitting, anything else in there? Yeah, crochet, no? A little bit of crochet. So uh, thank, you for, thank you for joining us and excited to hear your talk. Thanks, Brian, for the lovely and warm introduction. And I do want to thank everyone um, for having me here, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Stagg, Dr. Olson. Of course, it's been an amazing visit um, seeing your grand facility for the first time and meeting everyone. I've been super impressed. So it's really an honor to be here speaking to you today. Uh, I am going to talk about AI and ophthalmology, uh, which is something I started exploring a few years ago now. And instead of inflating the hype that AI has garnered recently, because I'm a little tired of that hype, I don't know if you are, um, I'll, instead I'll bring my perspective on um, some of the ways that we should really critically evaluate um, AI and ophthalmology now that everyone has entered this field. And I hope as a field um, that we can get to the point where we can level off a little bit on the hype and um, use the AI tools in the future to really help patient care, but also be very savvy about it and not to take it in, so to speak. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, my funding is listed here. So for this talk, you know, I'll give you kind of an outline. Um, I'll talk first about you know, what you might want an AI model to do in ophthalmology and some basic ways to evaluate AI models. And then I'll cover three big pillars of trustworthy AI, generalizability, explainability, and fairness. And for generalizability, that's will the models work anywhere else besides where you train them? Explainability, we heard a little bit about today, what it means to explain an AI model why you should take a lot of it with a grain of salt, and fairness, uh, which uh, we'll get more into at the end. So what might AI help you do in ophthalmology? And I think of this in two broad classes of tasks. There is predicting the future, um, and we actually heard a lot about that this morning, um, predicting progression of a disease, um, the, the sort of label or ground truth, the thing you're training your model to do is what the actual patient outcome um, is after some prediction date, right? And then there's a, another class of, um, of uh, tasks, which I'll call identifying the present. So that's sort of finding patients with a specific disease or characteristics, Diagnosing a disease from an image, is there diabetic retinopathy there or not today in this image, or you know all the sort of uh, segmentation uh, things that you heard about this morning, this is all sort of identifying the present. And the label here, the thing you're training your model to do is replicating some human provided ground truth, right? I think it's really important to not fall into the trap of thinking like, wow, my AI model is going to discover some new relationships between my outcome and some risk factors or features, right? You still need for that um, a, a hypothesis, traditional inferential statistics, p-values, right? That's not the purpose of the AI models that we're trying to train. 
So in this talk, I'll use as a running example, um, one of our ongoing projects to use electronic health records data or EHR data to predict which glaucoma patients will have progressive disease. And we heard a lot already um, uh, from other folks, like why this is such an important question, right? And this, this task falls into the predict the future category of tasks. Since we know that some glaucoma patients can remain stable for many years, but a minority sort of catastrophically progress or progress rapidly, if we could train an algorithm to distinguish them, then we could, you know, know who might need invasive treatments earlier on or who are lower risk um, patients. Um, that we don't need to see so often. And then the initial kind of proxy for progression that we used um, was which glaucoma patients would progress to need incisional surgery. So we've done a few variations of this model using different kinds of data sets, single center data sets, multi-center data sets, structured data only, text data only, combinations of these and imaging. And by structured data, I mean data that is stored in tables with numbers and codes. So visual acuity, IOP, all of those things, diagnosis codes, all of these would be structured data. And this we can get fairly easily out of electronic health records. The unstructured data would be text data, clinical progress notes, right? Doesn't fit neatly into rows and columns necessarily or imaging data as well. And at Stanford, we have um, aggregated all our electronic health records structured and te text data together and later on um, followed by visual fields and imaging data. That's one of the things that I had been working on ever since getting to Stanford to put it all together. And now we actually submit the electronic health records data um, to source the Site Outcomes Research Collaborative, um, which um, you all are a member of now, um, a consortium of um, up to 19 now, I believe, uh, academic eye centers across the US who are all submitting um, electronic health records data. So the examples I'll use in the rest of the talk come from this set of studies using this um, collection of data. And so the most basic versions of the models use electronic health records, structured da data, the tabular data, to model glaucoma progression. We've tried a variety of model architectures um, from simple to advanced, classical machine learning, um, regressions, uh, tree-based models. We've developed our own um, uh, architecture for the tabular electronic health records data. In the Stanford data, because we have more different types of data, we have the text and the imaging, we've done a few more different versions of the study where we could use large language models on the text data and combine some of these with the imaging and the electronic structured um, uh, data. And um, there's some evidence to suggest that if you bring in more different kinds of data types and the models perform well. But you know, honestly, I won't go into a lot of detail about the architectures of the different models. This is not a talk about how to train AI models using EHR data. This is more of a talk of how to critically evaluate those models. So when you're reading a publication about someone's AI model, like how do you kind of uh, critically evaluate it? How do you know the, uh, if the model is good, right? That's like the first question. Uh, what is a good AI model? Um, a very important and related question, of course, is how good are humans at this task, right? So for problems that are like identifying the present, finding diabetic retinopathy from fundus photos, like humans can be expected to be close to perfect, right? So the models have to be close to perfect to be considered good, right? But if you're predicting the future, it's not at all clear what is a good performance because it's so hard inherently to predict the future. And this was touched on in the morning as well. Like, you know, sometimes clinicians just don't feel comfortable predicting the future at all, right? So it's helpful to have a human baseline to compare um, model performance against. So here are some performance curves for early models. These ones were using large language models of the time on doctor's notes to predict which glaucoma patients would progress. And basically um, you want this these receiver operating curves or precision recall curves to be um, as close um, to either the upper left for ROC curves or the upper right on the precision recall curves. And you want the, a large area under the curve. And then the di diagonal line there sort of demonstrates a model that doesn't really do anything for us, right? And so initially, when we train these models, um, it was very demoralizing because we're looking at um, areas under the curve of 0.73, uh, right? And that's like not nearly as impressive as models which identify retinal lesions with like 
possibly almost perfect um, performance, right? But then, you know, get a human baseline, right? So I went through as the only human willing to do this, read a bunch of notes of um, glaucoma patients and try to predict um, who is going to need surgery. And none of these were my patients, right? So I'm just trying to guess. Um, and it turns out the human baseline performance is pretty poor, even though I consider myself to be a fairly good clinician. Right. So then, you know, suddenly the models are looking really good compared to the human baseline. Right. So that's um, an example where it's really important to get um, the right comparison. Um, so that's a situation where the model is better than it looks based on performance metrics. Here's an opposite situation where a model is actually worse than it looks based on the reported performance. Um, accuracy. So this happens all the time. People get up on podiums and say, I have a model that classifies something or predicts something with 99% accuracy or 96% accuracy. It's so great. Um, but, you know, if the thing you're trying to predict is very rare, like um, who has glaucoma out of the general population or who's going to progress out of everyone, you know, your model can look great even if it's trivial. Even if you, you know, never predict that anyone will progress or anyone has glaucoma, you can still get 90 something percent accuracy, right? So it's really important to look at all the other metrics as well, um, recall, precision, and so on, especially if you have an imbalanced um, outcome. So here's another example in our field where this happens a lot, which is predicting visual field progression. Train a model to predict future visual field from baseline visual field. Uh, say you're predicting mean deviation or something. And you might see a really nice plot like this one on the left. Oh, predicted an actual um, are really close together. They're like right on the line, right? Uh, maybe the mean absolute error is only two decibels. Like your model can get within two decibels of predicting the future visual field. But if you look at it closely, you might find that many of these types of models predict little to no progression on everyone, um, which is probably highly accurate overall for most patients who are stable, but it doesn't really help you um, for finding those patients who are actually progressing, right? You want to look at the fast progressors and see what those predictions look like. So buyer beware for these types of models. So that's, I've just talked about some of the basic metrics that we use or shouldn't use to evaluate our models. But part of achieving so-called trustworthy AI involves a somewhat higher, somewhat higher order ways of evaluating um, AI models. So this next section will cover generalizability, explainability, and fairness. So for generalizability, we want to know if models that train in any particular population will work in any other population, right? So this requires an external independently generated test set ideally from a different institution, maybe even from a different part of the world. And there's not that many studies that do this routinely because it's very hard to share data across institutions or even share models across institutions and run them on different data sets, right? So this is one of the really great advantages of being part of source, which aggregates multi-center data, because then you can do these kinds of generalizability studies. So this is an example where we trained our model, again, to predict glaucoma progression. At the time, we had six sites worth of data available. So I just trained the model on five sites of data and do the usual thing where you hold out you know, a, a, a test set from those five sites of data. So it's an internal test set. And then just reserve a six site from you know, that's totally independent and has totally different characteristics um, from the model that you trained on and see what is the drop in performance. And I kind of actually expected a quite a big drop in performance. So these are two of our best models. And you can see in the, in the, in the solid line uh, that performance on the internal test set. And then you can see in the dash line, the performance on the external test set. And actually there was very little um, degradation in performance. So I was really happy about that. But there might be a lot of reasons for that, which is that, you know, maybe all source sites, even if the patients are different or are sort of similar and that they're academic uh, from the U.S., we all use the same electronic health record system. So there are kind of reasons for perhaps um, a pretty good generalizability. This is another example, not from mine, but I thought it was a really good example um, where, um, you know, you can't take generalizability for granted. The authors here, they tried to classify glaucoma from fundus photos um, using their clinic population at um, Illinois Eye and Ear. They had their own real world photographs, but they also had the publicly available fundus photos downloaded from the internet. 
And they found, perhaps not completely surprisingly, that if you train a model on public data sets, it doesn't do very well in the real world. It doesn't work on their clinic data. So that's a failure of generalizability. But they could rescue it um, by kind of combining the data and training a model on combined data. And finally, one more um, illustrative example here. There's a famous um, study uh, looking at ROP stage from photographs in North America and Nepal, and they had multiple institutions in both locations. And they looked at this very systematically. So on algorithms trained in one location and tested on the same location, the models are very good. AUROC 0 0.99, 0 0.97, right? But then if you train in one location and test in, them in another location, the models were, I would say, moderate to terrible, right? And then if you combine the data in the last two rows, you see combined um, data and train the model on data from both locations, um, the performance can be rescued. So why does this matter? I just want to point out that in building these algorithms, we are not necessarily looking for some universal scientific truth that X factor influences Y outcome, right? We're trying to make a prediction. Um, if you're building some algorithm and you only ever plan to use it in your own local population, you know, your institution, and it doesn't work for as well for any other institution or patient population, like maybe that's okay, right? That's personalized medicine. It's personalized to your institution. Um, but the problem comes when you're trying to sell your algorithm and it's supposed to work somewhere else, or someone's trying to sell you an algorithm that's supposed to work on your data, that's when you have to ask yourselves the questions like, well, is that algorithm generalizable or will it work in the, in the intended target population? Okay, so the next part of evaluation I'll touch on is explainability. So unlike generalizability or fairness that I'll get to last, explainability is actually something that is quite frequently a form of evaluation that is performed and it's published with a lot of these um, AI algorithms. And in part, that's because we as clinicians demand it, All right? We want to know um, what is the model looking at to make its predictions? Why did you pr predict 42 for this data point? You know, model, explain yourself. So we demand it um, as a prerequisite for trusting a model's output. Um, but explainability studies in AI, I think, are also frequently misunderstood and somewhat misused. And I agree that we should always do explainability analyses, but I think that their role is a lot to do with sanity checking. And, you know, making sure you didn't accidentally leave in a feature like date or patient MRN or something that perfectly correlates with the outcome, and that's why your model is performing perfectly, right? Um, it's helpful then for kind of troubleshooting the models it can increase the trustworthiness of the models uh, for users if you know what the model is looking at to make predictions and those factors seem reasonable to you, then you can maybe trust the model more. But explainability does not precisely quantify relationships between predictors and outcomes, right? You still need regular statistics, hypotheses, p-values, right? And it's not for discovering novel risk factors for some outcome, right? Sometimes we get criticisms that are like, well, um, your model's not very interesting because you did explainability and it only looks at risk factors that we already know are associated with glaucoma. Um, but I would, you know, I wanna point out that, you know, actually if your model is looking at, um, you know, important factors that we know to be, um, associated with the outcome, then actually you're in pretty good shape, right? It's like, uh, it's the, that's where the model is trustworthy, right? You don't necessarily want a lot of spurious or new or really kind of weird things that are coming up in explainability, right? That's not kind of um, what you're looking for and what we're um, seeking with these models. And then there's kind of, you know, on a similar vein, there's defining biomarkers for disease. You know, there, there are, a lot of kind of newer types of models that are aimed at this, but most explainability studies are not designed to do that kind of work. And I'll explain why. So we all want certain things from explainable AI, but what we frequently get is something else. And I think it's useful to understand the difference. You know, we want as users global explainability, something where you can make a statement that the model mainly, re mainly relies on features X, Y, and Z to make its predictions overall. 
But what we usually get is a local explainability, meaning for one particular example in the test set, the model relied on these features. But for other examples, other people in the test set, other features will be important, right? So there's a difference there. We also want our models to be intrinsically interpretable, meaning based on the mathematics of the model, we can easily see, aha, this is the input feature that's driving the output. And in simple models like regressions, you know, logistic regression, linear regressions, we can look at the coefficients, right? So it's kind of built in um, explainability. And even in complicated models, we can sometimes do this if they have attention components. And there's a lot of active research in this area kind of trying to build inherently explainable models. But for most models, we kind of have to settle for a post hoc analysis where you look at the output of the predictions and then you try to relate them to the inputs in the model and you're basically guessing or trying to reconstruct and figure out what the model must have been paying attention to to make its predictions, right? So the way that works is you put in your inputs, it's a table or it's an image, something like that. You put it into your model and you get some predictions. And then you take a perturbed version of the original inputs, right? So you change the data somehow in the table or you cover up an area of the picture or something like that. And um, then you run it through the model again and you get new predictions. And then you compare the new predictions with the old predictions and say, okay, well, they've changed this much and we've changed the inputs that much. And then you can kind of calculate an importance to attribute to the part of the input that got disturbed, right? So here's some examples of that um, that we've done in the past. These are explainability examples for um, tabular data, where again, we used our glaucoma prediction models. You can do something called Shapley values. This is a game theory approach that we've borrowed, um, and it calculates kind of the marginal contribution of each feature to the model predictions over all subsets of features. So if you add the feature of IOP to all sort of combinations of other features, like how much does that change the model? How much um, effect does that have on the outcome? So then you can get a graph kind of like on the right, which shows the top most important features for a model. And each point is a single person or example in the test set. And then their position to the right or left of the axis tells you how much that feature influenced the prediction for that individual um, positively or negatively. So, you know, in the case of um, glaucoma, of obviously IOP, you would expect that to be like a really important um, predictor for um, progression, right? This is not the only um, method there, are, uh, although it is a very popular one, there's other ones like Lime, local, interpretable, model agnostic explanations. And it's another approach that just relies on perturbation of the inputs. We get some really beautiful pictures from imaging explainability methods where you can see the pixels are being highlighted over the areas of the picture that the model is paying attention to. These are all almost examples of local explainability, one picture explained at a time, where each individual input image has its own set of highlighted pixels. And I will guarantee you that the authors of each of these papers look through a bunch of examples to find the most beautiful ones that make the most sense to show in the paper, right? And so, we have the example of you know predicting identifying glaucoma and the model appears to be looking at the optic nerve or predicting whether the macular hole will close and and you know reassuringly the model appears to be looking um, you know at the actual macular hole right but all of those methods or most of them are estimates of what's driving the models for different examples if you use different methods you get slightly different results right so I, and if you have a different data set, you'll also get different results. So that's why I think that you use this kind of analysis to sanity check, not to declare some universal sort of scientific proof, uh, truth, or even to kind of generate hypotheses. And while we would all like to have models that are explainable, um, the truth is that may not always be possible or even realistic for many of the sort of most advanced model architectures nowadays. Even humans, though, can't explain themselves either. Um, and there's a whole rich psychological field of research into this. We, as humans, often have no idea why we make the decisions we do. We make the decisions and then we come up with plausible sounding reasons for them. We don't know. We don't know what were the stimuli really that like prompted us to make those decisions, right? So not relying on explainability might be okay uh, for models. It doesn't get us out of the requirement to make sure that the models work though, right? 
So um, I'll get to bias and fairness finally. And this is a big topic that is now actually very much top of mind in the general field of medicine and AI. But it's actually comparatively understudied in ophthalmology, but I think and hope um, that that will become more and more important in our field as we move forward. So I'll set the stage um, a little bit for why this is so important or has become so important in recent years. So there's been a reckoning in algorithms for medicine, and we're rightly examining kind of the impact that our algorithms have had on healthcare inequities. And there have been a number of high profile cases recently of bias found in AI algorithms, not just AI algorithms, but even just the everyday clinical algorithms and equations that we use, um, most famously the algorithm used to estimate kidney function from creatinine levels. And so that algorithm traditionally had a race component. It, ga it gave different estimates for kidney function depending on whether uh, the patient was black or not. But the studies had found that this race correction actually overestimates black patients' kidney function by 21% and results in delays in dialysis, delays in getting on the transplant list, delays in being referred to nephrology, right? It's had a huge, you know, real impact on patients. And so then um, new equations were developed um, without um, necessarily race correction, which performed better across the board, were immediately recommended to be adopted. Um, and now there have been sort of a systematic reexamining of all of the different um, kinds of equations that we use every day that have these sort of race components, right? They're in cardiology, they're in OB, they're in every field. So when we're making new clinical decision support tools or AI tools, I think it's very important to think about from the beginning where the bias can creep into the model. Because no one sets out to think like, oh, I'm going to make a biased model, right? We're all trying to be fair. But, you know, there are many reasons why this happens. At a data level, you know, some patients may not be represented in the training data um, due to geographic or temporal limitations, access to care, economic biases. Bias might arise from insufficient numbers of patients from uh, a minority protected group. Data might be missing for those patients um, in some non-random fashion. And we might also default to using features that are measured in convenient but incomplete ways. The thing that we're trying to train our model to predict might be an imperfect bias or imperfect proxy. And that means different things for different groups. So for example, if we use healthcare costs, incurred as a proxy for disease severity, then due to differences in access to care, minority patients might be sicker before they incur high levels of um, healthcare costs. So if you use cost as the outcome, then you'll end up with a biased model. And this was the subject of a kind of a, a very famous recent um, study that looked at health insurance um, uh, algorithms that were predicting cost. Even if we had perfect data going into a model or almost perfect data going to, into a model, sort of mathematically, sometimes the model training process can amplify the bias in it. And then once you have your model and you're trying to use it, you're trying to deploy it on live patient data, there is probably going to be some differences between that real data and the data that you use to train your model on. And those differences um, may cause sort of... Uh, uh, biases to become more apparent. And then some patients might not be served by the model or they might not accept the model. And that can also cause biases in, um, in health outcomes. And of course, the way clinicians um, and users interact with the model, they take their recommendations or they don't, um, might also um, change uh, how, uh, how the model performs in real life and um, the subsequent biases um, that can creep in. So here's just an example um, of the poor representation uh, of patients in models used to train um, deep learning algorithms. This is the review it's from 2020. It was published in JAMA and it showed that across many clinical deep learning algorithms that perform image analysis tasks, the populations were mainly from California, Massachusetts, and New York, and everywhere else um, was quite underrepresented. Um, I hope that's better now in 2024, so I should definitely do an update of this review, but I have a sneaking suspicion that it's really not that much better. Um, so given all the different ways that bias can creep into the models, like then how do we measure it? 
actually. How do we measure how fair a model is or how biased a model is? So you should know, I think, that this is more than just looking at a summary performance metric between different subgroups by race or ethnicity. It's more than just looking at accuracy between different groups, right? There's actually dozens of different definitions and approaches. And so at a base level, you might think anti-classification, this is the, the word for this. You could leave out sensitive variables. You could leave race out of your model, leave ethnicity out of your model, leave you know gender out of your model, make your algorithm kind of race blind, right? So that's one way, uh, one approach people have used. Classification parity refers to a whole host of um, fairness metrics where there are, you can make mathematical comparisons. You can, of course, compare accuracy, but you could weigh the equality in true positive rates or false positive rates or both of them across subgroups of patients. And whether you want to equalize um, which kind of uh, rate, it depends on the context of the algorithm and the cost of different types of misclassification. Is it worse to have a false positive or worse to have a, a, a false negative, right? So this is kind of an important um, uh, uh, choice to make here. And then finally, there's calibration, where you can look at a model and you look at the whole spread of um, predicted, say, risk of progression. And then you want to see, oh, of all the people who are predicted to progress at 80% uh, probability, did 80% of them actually progress? Right. You can look at it in every subgroup and see if there are systematic over predictions or under predictions across the entire um, model output. So going back finally to the glaucoma progression model we've been using as an example, um, using the data from source, we could finally do an in-depth analysis of fairness because of how diverse the population is and how large each subgroup can be. And I'll admit that Stanford's own local population isn't the most diverse, so it was really impossible to do this um, before we had access to kind of a larger data set. So the original model was trained on five sites of data, and there was, as I mentioned, an internal held out um, test data set. And then there were, at this, by the time we we're doing this study, there were two um, held out external sites with patients coming from um, completely different locations um, from the training set. And so there were totally a different distribution of disease and demographics. And there were um, three sensitive attributes we considered, um, race, ethnicity, and gender. And we in, uh, three different modeling strategies. We could include them into the models and use them to predict the outcome um, as usual. So that's model two. Model one was we left them out of the model. Um, and then we used a stratified approach also to try to train different models for um, different groups. And then we evaluated model fairness. And for this, we picked a... Um, measure called equalized odds, which is um, kind of becoming a very accepted or commonly used metric for fairness of models in um, the AI field. And so for this, we can compare between subgroups, true positives and false positives, and we want them to be equalized, right? So that's why it's called equalized odds. Um, and if there is a small gap between true positives between two groups and false positives between two groups, then we call the model um, more fair. But if there's a large gap in those um, odds, then the model is more biased. So first I'll point out um, some of the characteristics of the data set. Um, in total across all seven sites, there were almost 40,000 patients with glaucoma. Um, training took place on about 28,000 patients um, from the five sort of training sites. Um, looking at the demographics across sites, there was a slight female predominance. And considering race, overall, more than 60% were white. But if you looked specifically at external site one, this was a black predominant site with very few white patients. And then external site two had more white patients, but also a sizable Asian population and a little bit more of a Hispanic population as well. So that just shows a little bit of the demographic diversity um, across the different evaluation sites. So looking at the fairness results, um, we have the equalized odds here plotted here. It's a kind of a complicated slide, so I'll walk you through it. So we have the equalized odds plotted um, so that a fair algorithm would have a small difference between comparison subgroups. So the bars for a fair algorithm would be smaller and to the left, whereas a biased algorithm would have a bigger difference and longer bars. In the gray bars, we have the model that's blind to the attributes. In black, we have the normal model that has all the, all the information, all the attributes. And then the striped bars are separate models for each group. 
So what you see here in general is that our glaucoma models were definitely biased um, and which were the most fair modeling strategies depended widely, varied widely, depending on which groups we were comparing and at which sites. So for example, for gender, the most the standard model was actually most fair for two of the sites, but not the other one. For race, actually the most fair modeling approach was different for every test site. And then for ethnicity, models were actually just the most biased overall, and it seemed to favor separate models for each group. All right, so this is kind of complicated. You know, what is the conclusion that we can draw from this, right? I think the conclusion we can draw from this is you have to go looking for the bias in a model before um, being aware that it's there, right? So if you don't look for it, then you don't know that your model could be potentially biased uh, when you deploy it. And the other takeaway is it's not just enough to um, say that your model is fair because it doesn't look at race or ethnicity or gender or any of those sensitive attributes when it's making its predictions, because that's not uh, a fix that's gonna work um, in all situations. Um, so I think it's really important to do this kind of analysis basically on models before you um, try to deploy them. So how do we fix that, right? There are some special methods we can use to develop more fair or more generalizably fair models at each stage of development. Before training, ideally we'd like to collect better data, which is bigger and more inclusive and more diverse. And that's where the large registries like source are so helpful for that. And even if we can't collect sort of bigger data, we can also use weighting and resampling and things like that to kind of make the source data set more fair. During or after training, there are some technical methods that can improve the desired fairness metric or post-process the outputs after uh, the model is trained to kind of make it more fair. It's really critical that after you deploy the model, you have to have ongoing evaluation to compare the deployment data with the training data and then see how clinicians are using the model. And at every stage of development, there really should be multiple stakeholders involved because it's, you know, fairness is more than just kind of the mathematical comparisons um, that I presented, right? There's actually, you know, there's a lot of different issues that can come up. Like if you make the model more fair, it might have worse performance overall. And how much trade-off are you willing to accept? How much bias or how much, um, how much bias are you, are you willing to um, accept in a model in order, in service of having better performance overall, right? So there are some sort of philosophical questions that come up and it's helpful to have people from all walks of life and people who are doing ethics and, um, you know, to kind of weigh in on those, on those issues. Uh, so I'll summarize now, um, knowing what is a good model is a multi-dimensional task and it encompasses not only finding or reporting appropriate kind of basic performance metrics, but you've got to gather the right baseline comparisons, check explainability, do studies of generalizability and fairness and bias studies. So with this overview, I hope you get a sense of some of the challenges in building trustworthy and deployable AI in medicine and can see through some of that current hype. I don't wanna to sound totally negative though. I still think that there is so much potential um, to use these AI tools for good. And we can't forget that humans are also biased and difficult to explain and fail to generalize when transported to other locations, right? So while we definitely should evaluate AI systems on all of these dimensions, um, we should strive for uh, to be better than today. I'll take any questions and thanks so much for your attention. <laughs>